All right, three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Today's Thursday, January 23rd. Oh man, I gotta say, I it's it's 5:30 in the morning here. 5:30. I live on the West Coast. I am so sick and tired of living in the West Coast time zone. I'm so done. Like, here's the thing. I am so proud of myself. I got up early. I got up at four o'clock this morning. I made breakfast, got in the shower. I'm recording. It's 5.30 in the morning on the West Coast. You'd, you'd think like, oh, yes, Zach, you're, you're early. You're recording very early in the morning. Here's the problem. I'm on the West Coast. So it's already 8.30 in the morning on the East Coast. People are already at work. I'm like, I can never like, no matter how early I record on the West Coast, I'm always still late on the East Coast. I, I'm telling you, someday... I probably sound angry. I don't mean to sound angry. I just like, I, I hate being late. It drives me nuts. And someday I am moving to the East Coast time zone. I really so badly want to be like, I want when I'm actually early sometimes, I actually want it to be early. I hate like, if this comes out at 10 o'clock on the, uh, on the West Coast, it's already going to be 1 p.m. <laughs> it's going to be afternoon in New York. Like, man, dang it. It's, I, I, I'm telling you, a lot of basketball today. Uh, the NBA has really pulled me in. During the last couple of days, I like I, you know, believe it or not, I do watch other sports besides football. I think people think I'm only a football channel. I'm only a football podcast. And by the way, a lot of people also don't realize the show is on iTunes. It's on iTunes. It's on Spotify. It's on SoundCloud. It's an audio only version. If you want to hear that of the podcast, too. Um, when I'm excited about something, I got to talk about it. I, I just have to lean into it. And I personally like the thing in the last couple of days, the the thing that's been pulling me in has been basketball. Basketball has been so much fun for me. Uh, and that's a rare thing. Like, I'm a football guy. I love quarterbacks. I, I consider myself a quarterback analyst. But I'm telling you, uh, the NBA the last couple of days has just been like, I've just been watching it. I've just been enjoying games. I've been having a blast. Uh, last night I watched Zion Williamson play. And it was so much fun. So that's where I want to start today. Uh, Zion Williamson. Zion Williamson played in his NBA debut yesterday. Uh, the Pelicans hosted the San Antonio Spurs. I watched the entire game. I had so much fun. Uh, it was an interesting night. I want to start with the way the night started at the very beginning. The Pelicans' starting lineup was this. It was Lonzo Ball, Zion, Brandon Ingram, Drew Holiday, and Derek Favors. Notice they benched J.J. Redick to put Zion into the starting lineup. And I was really skeptical. I was like, really? Like, there's no way the Pelicans are better without J.J. Redick on the court starting. It just seemed wrong to me. And especially when I was watching the first half, I was like, this has got to be a mistake. Why is Zion the starter? Why, why did you replace Zion, why'd you replace Zion with J.J. Redick? It just felt weird to me. Uh, and, and that's because I was being impatient. You know, in the first half of the game, Zion had a really slow start. Uh, he was playing really conservative. He was just, in my opinion, trying to get by. It's his very first NBA game. It's the first half. He's trying to just get through the game and survive rather than trying to do his thing. And the coaching staff was pretty conservative, too. They really limited his minutes. He went in for, like, his first run in the first quarter was, he was in for three minutes and 51 seconds. In the second quarter, he went in for another, like, four minutes. And then they pulled him out. And so his halftime stats, he'd only played eight minutes. And he had two total points. And you're like, oh, two points. It was, it was mundane. He did nothing in the first half. I even wrote down on my notes. I said, like, in my notes, I wrote down, we might have to be patient and wait a game or two before he has an impact in the NBA because we just got to be patient. And ironically, I was actually wrong. I was very wrong. Uh, Zion had a crazy fourth quarter, which is like, what? It, it was so cool to me because it came out of nowhere, it felt like. At one point, he had 16 points in a row in the fourth quarter. Uh, he had multiple three-pointers. It was so fun to watch. I mean, I don't know. He, was, he scored at the rim. He had seven rebounds, which means he was just great down low. He's a super good athlete. But then also... When he was left open from beyond the arc, he made a couple threes, and I was like, what? All right, Zion, this is pretty cool. Um, the game wasn't really close. I mean, look, the Spurs, for most of the game, the Spurs were leading the entire game. For most of the game, they had a 15-point lead. Uh, at a couple points, they were back, you know, 15. Sometimes the Pelicans would close it down to a five-point lead. Uh, but during Zion's run, the closest the game ever got was during the fourth quarter when Zion Williamson was on his tear, scoring a bunch of points. He brought it all the way to a one-point game for a brief moment. And I was like, oh my gosh, Zion is like taking over this game. Uh, it was interesting because the Pelicans coach, Alvin Gentry, 
you know, really kept trying and kept wanting to take Zion out of the game. It was the fourth quarter, but he kept scoring points, and the crowd was into it. The team around him loved it, and it's like, well, the guy keeps scoring and scoring. He literally scored 16 points in a row, and so they just kept leaving him in, letting him play, letting him play a little bit longer. Um, but in the end, you know, first of all, Zion did finish the game with 22 points. Uh, he was 8 for 11 shooting. He was 4 for 4 from three-point range. He did have the seven rebounds I mentioned earlier, and he did all that in only 18 minutes on the court, which is like, okay. So if he plays, you do the averages. That's that's a really, I mean, that's more than a point a minute. It's pretty cool. But the Pelicans were really, really cautious. They limited his playing time. They, made it, they limited his minutes a bunch. They really were conservative with him. And this is where things get, and I like maybe a tad controversial. It's really up to you. I, I, I support what they did. But the Pelicans took Zion Williamson out of the game at the very end. Uh, the Pelicans had the ball. They were down three points with five minutes and 23 seconds left in the fourth quarter. And they took him out. And did it hurt their chances to win the game? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the Pelicans ended up losing the game 121 to 117. But I have no problem with their coaching staff and their, their franchise being conservative with their number one overall pick. Uh, you got to understand, there's a long-term plan here. You don't want to get caught up by a game, you know, like, oh, no, we might win a game in January, so we better risk our... Why, why go there? Zion Williamson is coming off of a knee injury. Uh, he's a rookie. He's new to the... Just There's no hurry here. Be patient. It's okay. Uh, there's so many future battles down the road. I just don't... I, I really support the fact that the Pelicans were like, we're going to play it conservative. We're going to play it easy. Um, let him ease his way into the NBA. This is a game that we're not going to remember really in a couple years. I mean, it's sad they lost. It really was because it would have been a cool way for Zion's first game to go. He comes in, has a crazy fourth quarter, wins the game. It could have been a storybook ending if they'd left him in. Maybe he could have won the game, maybe not. But this is a process, and I think everybody needs to be very patient with the process that's going on with Zion Williamson. I got to say, though, uh, I am, I'm super encouraged with the Pelicans just as a franchise. I mean, they had some great moments last night. I would call it um, like, fr- like flashes of brilliance where there are moments you're like, Oh, wow, that's a great shot by Lonzo. That's a great pass by Zion. That's a great rebound. That's Brandon Ingram making a good play. Like, multiple moments. Josh Hart had a three-pointer. I was like, that's a, wow. There were just moments where like, he had an and one early. I was just like, there were some moments where I was like, this is really like a young team on the rise. I mean, Lonzo looks way better than last year. Brandon Ingram is a, he's emerged as a star. Let's just be honest. They got Josh Hart. They have Zion, the, the rookie. They also have a veteran, J.J. Redick. They have, you know, plus they have Drew Holiday. Uh, there's a future here. And the good news about the New Orleans Pelicans is that it's not all on Zion. They've really put him in a great situation where he can grow with his teammates and grow with the people around him. And that makes me so excited. I'm like, I just look at the Pelicans and I go, they're doing everything right. They're just headed in the right direction. Even, even you know, taking their time and being patient with Zion. I just can't think of a scenario where you're like, you know, there's, it's, it's bad to be patient. It's bad to slow down. I just... When in your life did you regret being patient? I can't think of a moment where I, I just don't. I, here's the risk. The, the risk is if you, you rush Zion back, you play him more than he's ready, you hurt his knee again, why risk it? There's nothing wrong with being conservative. I just think everything the Pelicans are doing relating to Zion and just relating to the rest of their franchise is right. Again, Zion is the biggest, most popular player on their team. Biggest, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, but it's, it's a team effort here. And the fact that they've built a good, solid core of young players is like you look at a team like the Atlanta Hawks, and the Atlanta Hawks are they're built around Trey Young, and it's just Trey Young. That doesn't necessarily work. And look, the Pelicans are not an incredible team. I, I believe their record is now 17 and 28. Like they got a ways to go, but it's a young core of players that are building something. And I just believe in it. I think they're doing the right stuff. And I have patience for the Pelicans. I'm excited to watch it happen. Again, you got to understand this too. Um, Pelicans fans, I-, I feel encouraged. The guy had 22 points in 18 minutes. And here's what's cool is Zion isn't even in great shape yet. I mean, <laughs> it's pretty clear the guy, he needs conditioning, but he doesn't just need conditioning. He needs to lose weight. He needs to lose a couple more pounds. Uh, he'll be a lot more explosive if he does that. Right now on the roster, Zion Williamson is listed as 285 pounds. That would make him, if it's true, that makes him the third heaviest player in the entire NBA, which is absurd. The point is that I, I don't believe Zion is even operating at max capacity. There is more to there's more conditioning he can, more conditioning he can do. Uh, he could be in better shape. He can be in maybe a little bit lighter, a couple pounds shed off to be easier on the knees. Uh, it seems like Zion just has a really 
bright future. I mean, if he could do that last night, 22 points, 18 minutes, clearly limited minutes. Clearly the first half he was very nervous and being pretty cautious and conservative, just trying to get by. And, and, and one half of, he scored 20 points in the second half. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, and like 10 minutes, in the, he played 10 minutes in the second half and scored 20 points. I'm sorry, I'm going on a rant now. It just is like, it was fun. It was cool. And I'm telling you, I really believe there's a future here. Um, and I just think they're doing the right stuff. They've got, again, teammates he can grow with. They're limiting his minutes. I am so, so excited. And I'm trying not to get overly excited, right? It's a long process. Zion is a rookie. I think a lot of people are probably, especially today in the media, because this is what the media does. They go, Zion, ah, superstar. I take him. He should be, he's the best. Is he the best? Is that the best rookie debut in 20 years? Like, who, stop doing all that crap. Stop, you know, over stating everything. It was just a really good game. It was a cool moment. He had a cool fourth quarter where things went right. But I do I do think this is the beginning of a good future for Zion. Let's not be crazy here. Let's not say it's the best. Why? I mean, that's what the media does to get clicks. I understand. Um, but just I am excited for this one thing. I want to watch the development of not only Zion. Again, this is a team effort, a franchise headed in the right direction. So I'm not only excited to watch Zion Williamson and his development. But I'm excited to follow and watch the development of the New Orleans Pelicans just in general. It's so much fun to me. I had a great time watching the game. And uh, I'm excited to watch the Pelicans again moving forward. All right. Um, I want to check in with the NBA. So if the playoffs started today, here is how the NBA playoffs would look. Number one in the Eastern Conference, the number one seed would be the Milwaukee Bucks. They are 39-6. and six. The Miami Heat would be the number two seed, 31-13. and 13. The Toronto Raptors are 30 and 14. They'd be the number three seed. The Boston Celtics would be the fourth seed. They're 29 and 14. The Pacers are 29 and 16. They'd be the fifth seed. The Philadelphia 76ers, remember this team that's got incredible talent and great players all over the place? They're actually the sixth seed right now. They're 29 and 17. It's all a really tight race, though, between those first six, seed, six teams. Other than the Bucks are just in a league of their own. Even They're even better than the Lakers. The Orlando Magic are 21 and 24. They're below 500, but they are actually the seventh seed in the Eastern Conference playoffs, and the Brooklyn Nets are the eighth seed at 18 and 24. Now, the Western Conference is way more competitive, a lot more uh, you know, really active teams that are quite good. The LA Lakers are 35 and 9. They are the number one seed right now in the Western Conference. They are followed by the Utah Jazz, which are 31. They're 31 and 13, the Utah Jazz. The LA Clippers are the third seed at 31 and 14. The Denver Nuggets are the fourth seed at 30 and 14. The Dallas Mavericks are 27 and 16. They have Luka Doncic. I, I love a man. It's so much fun. They're 27 and 16. The Houston Rockets are also 27 and 16. They're the sixth seed. The Oklahoma City Thunder, man, we're going to talk about this story down the road. They're, my, they're a team that's fun to watch. They are 26 and 19. The uh, San Antonio Spurs are the eighth seed right now at the playoffs started today. They are 20 and 23. Now, in the hunt, here's what's cool. John Morant and the Memphis Grizzlies are 20 and 24. I would absolutely love to see John Morant, the, the rookie, the number two overall pick. He's a point guard. If he could take his team to the playoffs, the Memphis Grizzlies, they're a game out. Man, if they could make that happen, that would be so awesome. And another team in the hunt, the Blazers and uh, Carmelo Anthony making kind of a resurgence in his career, proving that he, in fact, I, I made a video a couple years ago saying Carmelo Anthony was cancer. Wrong. I mean, he he's really fitting in with the Blazers. They're uh, 19 and 26. They're not like a great team. They're way, well below 500, but they are actually uh, they're technically the tenth team right now in the Western Conference. They're in the hunt. I don't think they're going to make the playoffs. I really would love to see the Grizzlies make it. I'm from Portland, but I I'm not a Blazers fan. I'd love to see John Morant because that's a better story to me to see John Morant, a rookie point guard, get his team into the playoffs would be really cool. But the Blazers and the Grizzlies are two teams that are in the hunt right now in the NBA playoffs. Here are some of the storylines in the NBA that fire me up and make me really excited. I want to start with, we'll just talk about John Morant. If you don't know who he is, he's the number two overall pick uh, in this year's uh, most recent NBA draft. He's a rookie for the Memphis Grizzlies. He's playing fantastic. I mean, in my opinion, John Morant is, and I don't think anybody can beat him. Like people are, t there's a narrative today, like maybe Zion can come in and steal rookie of the year from John Morant. Stop it. He's going to play like, <laughs> it's January and Zion just played his first game of the year. How are you going to discredit the entire first half of the season for John Morant? Unless John Morant gets hurt or just massively drops off, John Morant is easily, and by a landslide, the rookie of the year in the NBA this year. Uh, he's got, you know, here's a crazy number I really love. The Grizzlies have played without John Morant six times this year. They're one in five without him and they, they're, they average losing by 12 points when he doesn't play. I mean, they get, 
He is a gigantic difference maker, a gigantic... He changes the game when he plays. He's a point guard. He's great. Um, he's averaging 17.5 points per game. His field goal percentage is 48.7. He's a great athlete. He's got a great basketball IQ. And again, I, I hate the way people compare Zion to John Morant. They're completely different athletes. You know, Zion is this massive athlete. John Morant's a little bit smaller, a lot quicker. Um, I, I just, I love the guy. I'm so happy for Memphis. I don't think we need to compare Zion and Ja. People will forever. Um, but I, I just, I love watching him. He's a cool story. Kind of, I didn't expect him to be this good this early. Um, and I, I just am so excited to watch him. Some people are even saying they'd rather have him than Zion. I don't know. I think Zion's more popular. Probably, uh, I mean, I think social media popularity does matter. He puts butts in the seats. I, I, you know, what drew me more to a basketball, to a, to watch a basketball game was it Zion or John Morant. Zion pulls me to a TV screen more. I think I'd rather have Zion, honestly, just for that factor alone, if they're even comparable players. Um, but yeah, I think John Morant's a great story that deserves a lot of respect and recognition this year throughout the NBA. And he's very clearly, to me, the rookie of the year. And it's going to be almost impossible to change my opinion on that. John Morant's phenomenal. Another crazy story to me is the Oklahoma City Thunder. I want to remind you guys of something that do you guys remember when the Thunder traded away Russell Westbrook? Everybody believed they were tanking. Well, currently, because <laughs> I, I really thought, I was like, man, they traded away Russell Westbrook. They got a bunch of draft picks. The Thunder have given up. They're trying to rebuild, and they're going to tank this year and get better draft picks. Well, currently, the Thunder are the seventh seed in the Western Conference. Not the Eastern Conference. It's far less difficult. No, the Western Conference, where it's really competitive. They're the seventh seed. They would make the playoffs if the playoffs started today. Uh, and it's funny, they're right behind the Houston Rockets where they traded Russell Westbrook. You know, the the <laughs> the Rockets are the sixth seed, and the Thunder right behind them are the seventh seed currently in the NBA playoffs. The leading scorer of the Oklahoma City Thunder is Shea, uh, Shea uh, Gilgius Alexander. He's awesome. I love him. Uh, he's a second-year player. He's 21 years old. He was the 11th overall pick two years ago in the NBA draft. It's cool how he's emerged as a really good player. And if you remember, Oklahoma City got him from the Clippers when they traded Paul George to the Clippers to L.A. Uh, I knew that Shaw, Shea had a solid future. I just, I had no idea he'd be this good and have this much of an impact this quickly in the season and this quickly into his career. But the coolest part to me is not Shea. It's actually that the Thunder are led by Chris Paul. You know, when Chris Paul came to the Thunder when Russell Westbrook was traded to the Rockets. The, here's how the trade was sold to me and how I even talked about the trade on the show. I said that, Russell Westbrook has been traded to the Rockets, and what the Rockets gave up was a bunch of draft picks. Oh, and by the way, they also included Chris Paul. Like Chris Paul felt like an afterthought, kind of like he was the change in the bottom of the cat. You just, oh, like you can have this too, why not? Well, Chris Paul has had a huge impact, and really, here's the other thing. It felt like to me the reason why the Rockets were getting rid of Chris Paul, and I think this is still true to this day, they wanted to get rid of his salary, and the Thunder were like, well, we'll take a salary, we can afford it. And we need the draft picks. I mean, I really don't know that. I mean, leave it to Sam Presti. Sam Presti maybe really wanted Chris Paul. Maybe he had the foresight. I, like I'm, I'm definitely not the basketball analyst that I am. I'm, I'm not as good a, an analyst of basketball as I am in football. But I, I'm telling you, uh, Chris Paul, I didn't expect to make this huge of an impact. He's 34 years old. And it seemed like when he played for the Rockets last year, he was slowing down at the end of the year. But I'm telling you, Chris Paul's leadership paired with his basketball IQ and his playing style is really, he's like the glue that keeps this Thunder team together. This is why they're winning. Um, I don't know, man. Chris Paul, he makes it work. It's so cool. I'm happy for him. And a lot of people don't like him, which I, I think it's because of his mouth. Maybe it's his persona. I don't know. I really like Chris Paul. I like his leadership style. He's very direct. He's not afraid to get in your face. I think he's the kind of guy that you wouldn't want to play against because he'll yell at you and he'll be mean to you if you play against him. But he's the kind of guy you want on your team because he's a scrappy, hard-nosed player. And um, he makes it happen, man. Chris Paul is the glue to the Oklahoma City Thunder. And he's not going to be in the MVP conversation. It's just like, it's kind of ridiculous. But if there was a a most, I don't like, valuable? Chris Paul is pretty valuable. I don't know where the Thunder would be without Chris Paul. He's not going to win MVP. He won't even be in the conversation. His story isn't good enough. His stats aren't good enough. But man, I'm telling you, he has had a massive impact on the Oklahoma City Thunder, more than people are giving him credit for. Now, another insane thing this season to me is Giannis. Giannis, the Greek freak out of Milwaukee. You know, he won the NBA MVP last year. And I'm pretty sure 
this year he's even better than he was last year, which is unbelievable to me. You know, his team, the Milwaukee Bucks right now, they're dominating the NBA. They have a 39-6 and six record. They're easily the best team in the East. I think they're going to make it to the, you know, I, one of the things I said in my preseason preview was, I guess it's a preseason preview, it's just my season preview. I was so excited to see the Milwaukee Bucks because I knew they'd be good this year. But my question was, can they finish their run? You know, they, they lose in the playoffs, it feels like, every year. Even though they have this great player, Giannis, can they finish their run and get to the actual NBA Finals? This feels like their year. This feels like the year that we get to see Giannis take his team, the Milwaukee Bucks, to the Finals and maybe, just maybe, even win. But I want to go back to when, when Giannis won the NBA MVP. He was out of the playoffs at the time. You know, he got knocked out. He wasn't in the Finals. And... Um, Giannis said he wanted to get even better as a basketball player. And, you know, what's crazy is that he did. It's a testament to his work ethic. He's a better player. He's scoring. You know, his shooting is even better. He's getting more assists. He's getting more rebounds. Uh, He's turning the ball over less. I mean, I'm telling you, Giannis became an even better all-around basketball player. And he won the NBA's Most Valuable Player Award last year. It's just crazy to me. And here's what's really cool. This guy was the 15th overall pick, which is not bad. He was, he was a first-round pick in the NBA for sure. But Giannis was, look at pictures of Giannis coming into the league, and then look at him now. He's buff. I mean, he's gotten, his muscle mass has dramatically increased. He's clearly done the work in the weight room. He's a better player all around. The work ethic Giannis has put in, not just in the weight room, but working on his skills as a basketball player since he entered the league, to me, is so inspiring. I don't know how you look at Giannis and don't go, that dude's work ethic is obvious, it's clear, and the progression he's made as a player is like just, wow. I mean, if you, if you value self-improvement at all or self-awareness or if you're a person who works in your field and you want to get better, I, like when I make a, the podcast, I want to get better every time I make an episode. I look at Giannis and the way he carries himself and the way he's improved throughout the course of his career and I go, I just am so inspired by that and I want to be like Giannis. I hope you do too. I mean, I encourage everybody Be like Giannis. If you can reach the pinnacle of your career and then still find a way to keep getting better, to me, that's just the best you can have. And uh, I I love watching Giannis. I love his progression, and it's so, so cool to me. Okay, let's talk about Markel Fultz. In 2017, Markel Fultz was the number one overall pick. And, um, you know, he struggled really early. He had some injuries. He couldn't shoot. He had a lot of problems. Some people said it was psychological. Maybe he had the yips a little bit where he was just nervous about shooting. And uh, the team that picked him, the Philadelphia 76ers, actually ended up giving up on Mark Fultz. They traded him away. You know, two years after picking him number one overall, they said, ah, and, you know, February after, February, they drafted him, waited a year. Then that next February, they said, hey, we're, we're done. We're going to move on from you. And uh, he's had a cool redemption arc. Look, it's not all the way finished. You know, uh, I think the way I would put this is it reminds me a lot of Ryan Tannehill is a quarterback for the Tennessee Titans. His former team, the Miami Dolphins, said, we're, we're moving on. You were a franchise quarterback. We don't believe in you. We're going to trade you away to the Tennessee Titans. And he took his team all the way to the AFC Championship game. He had a better year, and he proved he could play. And I, I think we're, we're at the beginning of an arc kind of like that, a story kind of like that for Markel Fultz, where, you know, he's had a couple nights recently where he scored over 20 points. He had a triple-double at one point against the Lakers. And uh, currently, <laughs> Mark Fultz's team is in the playoffs right behind his former team, the Philadelphia 76ers, which is kind of ironic and pretty cool. The story here to me, though, is that Mark Fultz is only 21 years old. He was what you call a one and done, which means he, he stayed in college for one year, then he immediately entered the NBA draft. And Mark Fultz was just not ready, in my opinion, for the NBA. I watched him at Washington. I'm from the state of Washington he was a good player. He had some good skills, but he was a baby. I mean, he was just a young, young guy. And so he went through a lot of struggles. He was just a kid early on in the year, in his career. And he's had a couple of career nights for him. And I, I think there's still hope for Markel Fultz. He's at the beginning of his redemption story, but he's definitely playing a lot better than he was in Philadelphia. And he still might live up to that number one overall pick status he got a while back. Um, I don't know. I, I just wouldn't give up hope on Markel Fultz. He's only 21 years old. And we bail so quickly on players. We're, we lack patience so much. But we forget that a guy entering the NBA at 18 years old or 19 years old after one year in college, for the most part, isn't ready. It's going to take a while for them to develop. But Marco Fultz is 21 years old. I mean, the guy has such a long amount of time in the NBA ahead of him. 
I think there's still plenty of time for Marco Fultz to develop. I would give him patience. I think it's really huge. And uh, I just, I'm really curious and excited to keep watching Marco Fultz develop as an NBA player. Okay. Uh, I want to remind you guys of a funky night in the NBA. It was the, uh, in the 2018 NBA draft. Think about this. The Atlanta Hawks drafted Luka Doncic, <laughs> number three overall. This is what I can't, I, I just will never be able to forget this. They drafted Luka. Then they traded him to the Dallas Mavericks for their number five overall pick, for the Mavericks' number five overall pick, Trey Young, and a 2019 first-round pick. So the Hawks had Luka Doncic on their team, and they traded him away. Right now, Luka's averaging 29 points per game, nine rebounds, nine assists. He's 20 years old, 2-0, 20. Two years younger than me. And he's a generational talent in the NBA. He's a multimillionaire. He's killing it. He's so clearly the future of the NBA, one of the brightest stars the brightest young star, I think Giannis is there, but Giannis is a little bit older. I mean, of like the first, first year or second year players, Luca is the guy. He's the best young player in the NBA. And, uh, you know, oh, and by the way, currently his team is the fifth seed in the NBA's Western Conference. He's in the playoffs if they started today. Now, that's not entirely him. He's got good teammates helping him out. But man, the contrast between Luka Doncic and Trey Young is just. It's loud. It's loud. It's obvious. It kind of punches you in the face. It's like, man, I, I feel almost bad for Trey Young because Trey Young is a good basketball player. Trey Young is not bad. You know, he's averaging, he's also averaging, by the way, 29 points per game, which is what Luke is averaging, you know, plus four rebounds a game, nine or eight assists. But Trey Young is just clearly not the same. I mean, Luke is a generational talent. You can have good numbers. Trey Young does have good numbers. But he's always going to be overshadowed by Luka Doncic. And I can never, I'll never be able to forget the time that the Atlanta Hawks briefly had Luka Doncic. And they, tra- they let him go. They traded him away. What the heck? It's so interesting, man. And by the way, uh, the Atlanta Hawks have an awful, awful record. They have Trey Young. They had Luka. They don't have him anymore. And <laughs> the Atlanta Hawks are 11-34. and They are dead last in the NBA's Eastern Conference, the worst of the two conferences in the NBA. It's just crazy to think to me that the, the Hawks briefly had Luka Doncic and they traded him away to the Dallas Mavericks. I just, man, I'll never be able to forget that. Okay, uh, it's so cool. I wish more guys were like Jimmy Butler. I want to talk about Jimmy Butler because um, a, a while back, the Miami Heat head coach, Eric Spolster, was talking about Jimmy Butler. And uh, he said that stats are not the only reason why Jimmy Butler is a max contract player. He talked about how Jimmy Butler's leadership and work ethic really stand out and really make the Miami Heat better. And I I just want to say, again, I I wish more people were like Jimmy Butler as a franchise player. Uh, A lot of guys just score points and they cash in checks and they're happy with that. Jimmy Butler goes above and beyond. You know, he's a leader. He's the heart and soul of his team. And if I was an NBA general manager or an NBA owner... I would feel so good about giving a max contract to a guy like Jimmy Butler. That's the kind of guy who deserves it, who earns it, who gives everything he has, his heart and soul, to win basketball games. He's not just a guy who cares about making money and scoring points. He wants to win. He's hungry. And he pushes the guys around him to be better. And some guys, you know, lazy people, don't want to work with Jimmy Butler. People who are lazy don't like playing with Jimmy Butler. He had problems in Chicago. He had problems at his last stop in Philadelphia. He rubbed people the wrong way. But I'm telling you, if you put Jimmy Butler with a group of guys who want to win, who work hard, want to put their heads down and win games, they're hungry. He's perfect. If you put Jimmy Butler with a group of guys that want to win, oh my goodness. That's exactly what's happening. That's what's happening with the Miami Heat. The Miami Heat right now are the number two overall seed in the Eastern Conference because Jimmy Butler is just pushing them and pushing them, and they are responding. You know, he's one of my favorite NBA players. I love Jimmy Butler, the passion, the work ethic he has, but the passion he plays with and the, the way he just goes after it, and he cares. He wants to win. There are a lot of players in the NBA who don't care about winning. They're happy to just, I've said this before on this topic, I'll say it again, they have no problem making a ton of money, scoring enough points to keep their reputation high. They don't need to win. Jimmy Butler's not one of those guys. And to me, I, I'm grateful for that. I appreciate that. I wish more people in the NBA were like Jimmy Butler. 
Here's another fun storyline. I don't have a lot about it, uh, but currently the Indiana Pacers are 29 and 16. They're fifth in the Western in the Eastern Conference. Excuse me. The Pacers are fifth in the Eastern Conference playoff standings. And what's crazy is they don't even have their star player Victor Oladipo right now. Uh, he hasn't played all year. He's recovering from a knee injury last year, and uh, he'll come back into the lineup on January 29th. That's going to be a day. I, I'm going to watch that game January 29th. It's the Pacers against the Chicago Bulls. And, um, you know, it's going to be an adjustment because the Pacers have found a way to win games without Victor Oladipo. So they're going to have to find a way to work him back into the lineup and have, you know, they're probably going to have some chemistry issues at first. That's what happens in basketball. But you would think on paper, man, you introduce Victor Oladipo back into your roster, back into your lineup, your best player on your team. You would think the Pacers are going to get even better. That's what I want to follow and see. Do they, in fact, get better? And if they do get better, how much better do they get? Because they're fifth in the East right now. Could adding Victor Oladipo make them third, second, fourth? I have no idea. Does it even help? Do they have so many problems it takes a while for them to recalibrate with their roster, with their lineup? I don't know. But that's a storyline I can't wait to watch and follow. Is on the 29th of January, Victor Oladipo will make his return to the Indiana Pacers. All right, um, I want to. This is how I want to end this topic. I, this is my kind of my check in with the NBA. We talk about the standings. We've kind of bounced around the league for a couple things. I want to end with this really cool story. Uh, I'm going to make an analogy actually first. Um, is it Shia LaBeouf or LaBeouf? You know, Shia, you know the kid from Holes. He was in Even Stevens. He was in. He's been in Transformers. Shia LaBeouf or LaBeouf or La 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 LaBeouf. However the hell the heck you say his name. I don't know how you say it. But Shia, or even another one is. Uh, Oh, what's the kid from Harry Potter? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Shia LaBeouf. We'll go with this one. Shia LaBeouf is, and it does actually matter because Shia LaBeouf is a far more interesting actor than the guy from Harry Potter. I love Shia LaBeouf. I watched a movie called The Peanut Butter Falcon the other day, and you got to understand, Shia is a multimillionaire. He was in Transformers. He was in Even Stevens making TV as a kid. He made holes. He's got millions and millions of dollars. He doesn't ever need to work again. I mean, it's just to me that's that's interesting. But Shia LaBeouf is still acting in movies. He was in a movie, again, I saw recently called The Peanut Butter Falcon. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Why does he make that movie? Why does Shia LaBeouf keep acting in movies if he doesn't need to? Because he loves it. He loves the process of making movies. Daniel Radcliffe is a guy from Harry Potter. Daniel Radcliffe is set for life. Daniel Radcliffe was in the Harry Potter movies as from the time he was like 12 till, you know, for years. The guy made millions and millions and millions of dollars. Daniel Radcliffe never needs to work again. Why does he keep working? Because he loves making movies. And every once in a while, very rarely, because Daniel Radcliffe's movies are way weirder and harder to watch for me than Shia LaBeouf's. But whatever. The point is this. They do it out of love. There's something similar happening in the NBA for that long, drawn-out story that I hope made sense to you. The point is that Tim Duncan right now is working for the San Antonio Spurs as an assistant coach. Tim Duncan is an NBA Hall of Famer. He played 19 years in the, in the NBA. He made an estimated over, an estimated $240 million during his time playing in the NBA. Tim Duncan's set for life. He's set for life. He's got a gigantic reputation. He's an NBA Hall of Famer. He never needs to do anything again. And I think this is why it's cool to me. The fact that he, he doesn't need to do it but he still does is cool because it clearly tells me Tim Duncan loves the San Antonio Spurs. He loves Greg Popovich and he loves basketball. He wants to be around and be involved with basketball. I love and respect that. I was talking to my dad the other day. It's like why? Jason Garrett was the backup quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys and Jason Garrett became a coach. And I was like, okay, how come you never see Hall of Fame quarterbacks like, like Troy Aikman was once also a Dallas Cowboys quarterback with Jason Garrett why did Troy Aikman not become a coach? Why did, why, I don't think Tom Brady's going to become a football coach when he's all said and done. I don't think Peyton Manning's going to become a football coach when he's done playing. Why do former amazing players become analysts and not coaches? Here's why, in my opinion. When you go from playing basketball or playing football or playing a sport and you're the best at what you do, you've climbed the mountain. Every single day has been a battle. You're working constantly to try to get better. The minute you retire, it's like, oh, I'm done. I can have a break. I can step back from the thing that has been a a grind my whole life. I can take a break. I'm done. And when you do that, you let your foot off the gas. It's a huge relief. 
But then the thought of going back into grind mode ever again is nearly impossible. That's why uh, Magic Johnson, I think, really struggled when he was the team president of the LA Lakers because he could never... I, I don't think he wants to do the work and the grinding of being an NBA general man, of being an NBA president, a team president, doing the things he needed to do. So here's my point. I want to really appreciate and respect what Tim Duncan is doing because he went back to coaching. He could have done a lot of stuff. He could have never worked again. He could be on a beach in Fiji. Tim Duncan doesn't need to coach, and he's doing it because he loves it, and he wants to grind. He wants to do the work. I mean, man, that to me, what a more, is there a more inspiring or cool reason to do something than because you love it. That's why Tim Duncan coaches, because he loves coaching and he loves the game of basketball. I just want to give that a round of applause. Great job, Tim Duncan. To me, that's really cool. And I thought that was worthy of uh, being appreciated here on Strong Opinion Sports. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. I'm going to take a short break. When I return, we're going to talk about the NHL. I haven't talked about the NHL at all. Like, literally, ever. I, don't think, I, I can't think of a single time I've ever, ever talked about the National Hockey League. We're going to do that coming up. And then we're going to share a little nugget of information around uh, about, NHL, uh, about the NFL OTA process and uh, why OTAs are important. We got a nugget of information from Joe Brady, the new Carolina Panthers offensive coordinator. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. I'm going to take a short break. I will be right back. All right, we are back. Um, I want to do something I have never, ever ever done before on Strong Opinion Sports. I want to talk about hockey. (laughs) And um, currently the NHL All-Star break is happening. And uh, I want to say I love hockey, by the way. I'm I'm very much a fan of watching live hockey. I grew up in Portland, Oregon. And uh, I grew up going to, occasionally, my friends, families, their parents would have tickets and they would take me to go see Portland Winterhawks games. And I'm telling you, uh, hockey, there's nothing like live hockey. When you can hear people and you can hear collisions live, it makes it makes the experience way better. With the crowd, you're chanting, you're yelling. It just the whole thing is better when you're live. And look, I, I love hockey. I understand the rules of hockey. I know how power plays work. Um, but one thing I've never done before, I've never ever tried to follow the National Hockey League. I've never once followed the NHL. I had ki- like cards when I was a kid. I had hockey cards, but that's as far as it went. I know who Sidney Crosby is, obviously, um, but This is my very first attempt at trying to follow the NHL. So I I ask this. um, I'm learning about the league as I go. I'm literally learning how the playoff system works right now. Like, I'm I'm new to this whole thing. And so uh, hardcore hockey fans might hate the way I cover the NHL. And, like, I I got no problem with that. You might hate my approach. I'm going to be myself. I'm going to share my experience as I get to know the league and learn the storylines and I'm going to enjoy learning it. Like, I am really passionate about sports, and I'm passionate about sports stories. And it's a bit daunting because I'm not a hockey expert at all. Like, like I'm a quarterback analyst. I know the game of football really well. And even more than that, I know that I know quarterbacks. You can go to quarterbackanalyst.com. Literally goes to my videos. Like, you, I know the position of playing quarterback, and then I know football pretty well. But I... I'm not a hockey expert. I'm not a hockey analyst. I'm a hockey fan. And I'm going to share my fandom... I'm not going to pretend to know things I don't know. I'm just going to be myself. I love sports stories. Uh, I'm beginning to follow the NHL. I can't cover everything. If there is something you want me to talk about in the NHL, let me know. Because I'm, I'm all ears. So I'm, this is my first experience doing something I, I've never done before. And I'm excited because, I, to me, I, I think it's quite cool to do so. So I want to start with this. Um, if you don't understand how the NHL playoffs work, you maybe you do, right? But uh, to be very clear, to level to everybody, this is like hockey for dummies. This is how... The NHL playoffs work. There are 31 NHL teams. There are soon to be uh, 32, by the way, because Seattle is getting a team very soon. And the NHL playoffs have four rounds with seven team, excuse me, seven game series. So the best of seven series. And uh, there's an Eastern Conference and a Western Conference. And there are four divisions. So in the Eastern Conference, you have the Atlantic and Metro Divisions. And in the Western Conference, you have the Central and Pacific Divisions. 16 teams make the NHL playoffs. Eight teams from the East, eight teams from the West. The top three teams in each division get in. So that means there are four divisions, so 12 teams get in by winning their division. You know, two from the Metro, two from the Pacific, two from, or excuse me, three from the Metro, three from the Pacific, three from the Atlantic, and three from the Central Divisions. Then there are four wildcard teams. The way you become a wildcard team 
is the after their the three and three are chosen, the two remaining teams of the best record, no matter what division they're in, from the east or the west, make it into the wild card spot. And then the way that you're determined on seeding is based on your points scored. So the highest seed is the team with the best record, and they play the team with they play the wild card team in the first round that has the fewest points scored so far throughout the NBA season. That means literally like scoring goals. So three things matter for the NHL playoffs. You have wins, you have losses, and then you have goals scored during the season, which literally means how many goals did you score throughout the course of the year. So if the NHL playoffs began today, in the Eastern Conference, you would have the number one seed in the Atlantic Division would be the Boston Bruins. They're 29 10, and 10. They scored 70 points. The Tampa Bay Lightning would be second. They have, they're 29 and 15. They have 62 points scored. The Florida Panthers would be third. They are, they're 28 and 16 with 61 points scored. In the Metro Division, you have the Washington Capitals, number one. They're 33 and 11. They have 71 points scored. The Pittsburgh Penguins are second. They are 31 and 14 with 67 points scored. The New York Islanders are third. They're 29 and 15 with 63 points scored. And in the wild card from the Eastern Conference, you would have the Carolina Hurricanes, which are they're 29 and 18 with 61 points scored. And the Columbus Blue Jackets, who are 26 and 16 with 60 points. Can anybody know? I, I li- this is how little I know about the NHL. Is that Columbus, Ohio? Like, if someone out there, I could look it up. I, I'm, I will literally when I'm done recording this. But I think it's, if that's Columbus, Ohio, that's pretty cool because that means Columbus, Ohio has Ohio State football and an NHL team and good college basketball. And, oh man, Columbus is, I'm telling you, I'm going, to, I'm going to Ohio. I am moving to the East Coast, Eastern time zone. I'm making it happen. Now, on the Western Coast, on the Western Conference, excuse me, you have, in the Central Division, the St. Louis Blues are in the number one seed. They are 30 and 11 with 68 points scored. The Colorado Avalanche are second. They're 28 and 15 with 62 points scored. The Dallas Stars are 27 and 17 with 58 points scored. In the Pacific Division, you have the Vancouver Canucks, which are, they're 27 and 18 with 58 points scored. The Edmonton Oilers are 26 and 18 with 57 points scored. The Calgary Flames are third in the Pacific Division with 20, they're 26 and 19 with 57 points scored. And the wild card in the Western Conference, the two teams I, I'm really excited and, you know, interested in, you have the Arizona Coyotes, who are KOTs, excuse me, who are 26 and 20 with 57 points scored. And another team with 57 points scored is the Vegas Golden Knights, who we'll get into their coaching situation in a minute. The Vegas Golden Knights are 25 and 20 with, again, 57 points scored. I want to get into that whole talk, you know, talking about NHL coaches. So my first impression of the NHL is that, you know, people and owners are incredibly, incredibly impatient. It's, it's wild to me. Seven NHL coaches have been fired this year, and they got fired midseason you know, before even the All-Star break happened, which is about the midpoint of the year. It's just wild to me. There are 31 NHL coaches. 14 of them this season are in their first year with a new team. Only three NHL coaches have been with their team since the 2015-16 season. Which means that in the NHL, there's just a ton of fluctuation. You know, owners are tired of waiting for wins and waiting for success. Expectations are you got to win right now, immediately. It's very important. Uh, So, like I said earlier, seven NHL coaches have been fired so far this year. Five of them were fired because their team was underperforming. Two of them were fired for conduct reasons. I want to start with this. The San Jose Sharks fired their head coach, Peter De Bo- uh, DeBoer, because DeBoer? DeBoer. We'll call him DeBoer. Uh, that's how the guy... I, I was, what did I do? I was watching a, an NHL game, literally because I was trying to figure out how to pronounce his name. The announcer called him DeBoer. So they cleaned house. They fired three of his assistants, and they, they quoted this by saying it was purely a hockey decision. Uh, DeBoer was fired and had nothing to do with anything off the rink. It was clearly they felt like their team would be better moving forward with a different coach. They weren't scoring enough. They weren't capitalizing on power plays enough. And the team had discipline issues because they had a lot of penalty time. So they decided we're going to fire Peter DeBoer. Now, what's interesting to me, though, is that uh, you know, <laughs> Peter DeBoer is fired, but... If I can ever find my notes. What the heck? Where is the note I want? Oh, here it is. Back here. What am I doing, Zach? I'm so silly. Here we go. The Vegas Golden Knights fired their head coach, Gerard Gallant. Here's why it's so odd, really odd. So they fired Gerard, Gerard, uh, Gerard Gallant. 
Gerard Gallant is a successful NHL head coach. He's been the coach in Vegas for three years. This was his third season. Gerard Gallant's first season ended with them losing the, in the Stanley Cup Finals. Last year, in his second year, they made it to the playoffs. And then this year, midseason, when he wasn't good enough, they fired him. They cut bait. And it's so, so odd to me. I'm like, what the heck? Why would you do that? By the way, when they were fired, when they fired Gerard Gallant, he was in fifth place, which meant he was uh, the, the last wild card spot in the NHL playoffs if they'd started today. But here's what's even more interesting. The minute they fired Gerard Gallant, they went out and hired Peter DeBoer, the former Sharks head coach. They went and got him. I don't know if they, it's very, I don't understand this to me. It's like, I don't get it. Uh, Peter DeBoer was fired for underperforming, and they fired Gerard Gallant for underperforming, even though he's won before. I, I just, to me, like, okay, like, fire Gerard Gallant if you want, but I don't really understand that. Uh, I don't, from my outside perspective, I go, that seems like a weird, weird move that I, I wouldn't have made. Now, two, two coaches have been fired so far in the NHL season for conduct issues. Uh, Bill Peters was fired by the Calgary Flames after he received allegations from the past about racism and abuse. Uh, it was a really bad look for the Calgary Flames, so they decided to just cut bait and fire Bill Peters. Now, the Dallas Stars fired their head coach, Jim Montgomery, due to what they called, quote, unprofessional conduct. Now, he got fired a while ago. This is an old story now. Uh, apparently, the guy has, this came out later from a, a third-party reporter, it came out that he has a, an alcohol issue and is apparently in recovery. You know, alcohol abuse stuff came out in early January, which is significantly later than when he got fired. I do want to say that I really respect the way the Dallas Stars handled firing Jim Montgomery. They were really, they, they gave him privacy. You know, they didn't call him out. They didn't humiliate him. They didn't say, this guy has a tr problem holding his alcohol. They didn't do any of that. They just very quietly said, here's what it is. It's a, he has an unprofessional conduct issue. We're going to get rid of him. We're going to part ways. But they could have done it way differently to humiliate him, and they didn't. They really were classy with the way they fired him. And I respect the Dallas Stars for doing that. Uh, again, they, they respected his privacy. The report about alcoholism and uh, alcohol abuse and going into rehab did not come from the Dallas Stars. They were, they were quiet here, and they respected uh, Jim Montgomery's privacy. I think it's just an interesting touch, so that was pretty cool. Now, oh, we're going to get into Mike Babcock. Mike Babcock, if you ever want to do some interesting reading, Google Mike Babcock and his former players. I mean, oh my goodness. I, 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 for the show's sake, I parsed it down to very you know, simple facts, but I'm telling you, let's just go with this. Mike Babcock was fired by the Toronto Maple Leafs as their head coach because the team was not living up to their expectations. And Mike Babcock is a very interesting dude. It's notable because he won a Stanley Cup final in 2008 with the Detroit Red Wings as their head coach. But it's interesting because his legacy is now up in the air because a former player of his, Red Wings former forward Darren McCarty, actually called out Mike Babcock. He said the team won a Stanley Cup final in 2008 in spite of him, and that in 2009 in the Stanley Cup final, they lost because of him. They won in spite of him, and they lost because of him. It's very interesting. If you don't know the history of the Stanley Cup finals, in 2008, the Detroit Red Wings played the Pittsburgh Penguins, and the Red Wings won. They beat the Penguins. Now, in 2009, they got a rematch. The exact same Stanley Cup Finals happened again a year later. Complete rematch. I wish I'd followed hockey back then. I would have been all over that. That's pretty cool. Imagine getting a rematch of the Super Bowl the next year after this one. I mean, that's just wild to me. And so this time around, though, the second time around, 2009, the Penguins actually beat the Red Wings. And McCarty called him out. He blamed... Babcock for the loss. Uh, he called him stubborn, disrespectful. He accused him of intentionally misusing players to prove a point and demonstrate his power. You know, his way or the highway. And at first, when I read all this stuff from Darren McCarty, I was like, okay, look, this is a former player. He's a scorned player. He's mad. It sounds like uh, the guy, uh, Cassius Marsh, who left the Patriots and was like, it's not fun to play for the Patriots. I was just skeptical. I'm like, okay, every once in a while, you have a guy who's bitter about a loss and holds on to a grudge and is mad. Fair enough. But then I did some more digging, and this wasn't just one bitter guy. This was also multiple former players that have played for Mike Babcock have come out and called him out too. They called him a jerk, uh, a terrible person, one of the worst people they've ever met, all kinds of crazy stuff. And to me, what it sounds like is this is more speculation. I'm kind of, I'm trying to take what I read because I read so many, like 
so many reports of former players just trashing their coach. What I think happened is that Mike Babcock is an old school guy who who yells, he's demanding, he's really tough. He's clearly not kind. Like he doesn't connect with his players on a personal level to a way they would like at least. Um, and sports are changing now. You know, sports really players no longer tolerate having coaches like that that treat them harshly, that aren't patient, that are are just a holes, man. No, people don't tolerate that anymore in the world of sports, uh, even in a, a tough guy sport like hockey. And what this really reminds me of, if you're a football fan, uh, the Jaguars fired their uh, they fired Tom Coughlin, one of their executives of football operations, because he was controlling things. He was extremely controlling. He was excessively fining players, and the players were like, "No, no, no, we're not putting up with this. Times have changed. We're not we're not doing this anymore." And I think a similar thing has happened with Mike Babcock, where his style of coaching is now outdated, and unless he changes something, it's just not going to work and not going to last. Because, again, his former team, the Toronto Maple Leafs, they also called him out for being not so great to play for. Now, the New Jersey Devils also fired their head coach. This will be a short one. Uh, they had a terrible start to their year. They had a bad record. They weren't scoring goals. Um, now, it is worth saying, though, here's what's interesting. John Hines got fired, the head coach of the uh, New Jersey Devils. He took the blame for the bad start of the year for the Devils. But they fired their coach in early December. It's now late January, over a month later, and the Devils are still a bottom four or five team in the NHL. It's not like they're suddenly getting way better with a different coach. So I don't think all the blame should have gone to the coach. Maybe John Hines was a giant problem, but the roster also had issues. And we'll get into Taylor Hall. Taylor Hall used to play for the... uh, the 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 Devils, but he wasn't working. There's a lot of factors that went on with why the New Jersey Devils weren't working. I don't know that it was entirely on the coach, John Hines, because clearly without him, they're still awful. Now, the Detroit Red Wings are by far the worst team in the NHL. I want to give you some perspective here. Uh, for context, here are a few of the, the worst teams, like the bottom five teams in the NHL, you have the Ottawa Senators. They're 17 and 23. They've scored only 42 points this year. Uh, the New Jersey Devils are 17 and 24. They've scored 41 points this year. The Anaheim Ducks are 19 and 24. They scored 43 points. The LA Kings are 18 and 27. They scored only 41 points. So these teams are awful. They have around 17, 18, 19 lo- uh, wins, 24, 23, 27 losses, and they scored around. 40, 41, 42 points. I mean, there's a common, like, that's pretty bad. But here is by far, well below those other teams, the worst team in the NHL, the Detroit Red Wings. They have scored only 28 goals all year, which is 13 worse than the second fewest goals. The second fewest uh, goals scored all year are 41. They've scored 28. That's awful. They have 12 wins. They have 34 losses. The The Detroit Red Wings are by far an absolutely atrocious awful team. They're the worst team in the NHL. And it's crazy to me. It's odd to me that all these teams are firing their head coaches, and yet the Detroit Red Wings haven't lifted a finger. They haven't fired their head coach. And there's a story here. I don't know what it is. I got to do more research and figure out why why are the Red Wings so bad, and why is their coach still in place? But maybe it's not the coach's fault. I mean, if they haven't fired the coach, and that's not the rumors I'm hearing, maybe it's just that uh, the roster really is so bad that they actually aren't blaming the coach. That'd be interesting, but maybe that's what's happening. Now, the last coach who was fired in the NHL was that the Nashville Predators fired their head coach, Peter uh, Laviolette. Laviolette. It's a hard one to say. I want to call it Laviolet, but that's wrong. It's Laviolette. Um, Peter Laviolette coached for... He's coached in Nashville for six years. This was his sixth season. He's actually coached for five and a half years because he got fired midway through his sixth year. And here's what's interesting. The first five years he was there, this year doesn't count because he got fired mid-year, but the five years he was in Nashville, he made the playoffs all five of those years. In fact, he even made it to the Stanley Cup final one year, the 2016-17 season. He made it to the Stanley Cup finals and lost. So he's a good coach. He's been an NHL head coach for 18 seasons, been to the Stanley Cup finals three times. He even won once in the 2005-2006 season. Uh, He won with with Carolina. And at first, I thought it was weird that Peter Laviolette was fired. I was like, is he, is he a good coach? He's coached for years. He's won a Stanley Cup. He's been successful, made it the playoffs five years in a row. Uh, you know, five years, five, you know, coaching for five years, making the playoffs five years in a row, 
making one of the times a Stanley Cup playoffs. Year six, getting fired midseason. It didn't add up. I was like, what happened? But then I simply had to realize, okay, well, it's all about wins. The team was underperforming. Uh, he lost six games in a row in November. And uh, the, Washington, the, the Nashville Predators just weren't good enough. They have a roster worthy of a Stanley Cup final. And the team wasn't even in the playoffs hunt at the time when Peter Laviolette was fired. So I get it. Uh, but he's a good coach. Peter Laviolette seems like a really good coach. He's got a good resume. I hope he bounces back. I think maybe he just overstayed his welcome in Nashville. And when a coach is in a, a place for too long, it's easy to get stagnant, easy to not keep reinventing yourself. Or maybe maybe that's what kind of happened is he de- he just got stagnant after a while and overstayed his welcome. I don't know. Uh, but it's interesting to me that Peter Laviolette, who is a clearly good NHL head coach, got fired from his job after making the playoffs five years in a row and had a rough start to this year. They just said, nope, we're done. Something happened there, and it's very weird and interesting. Now I want to talk about Taylor Hall. Taylor Hall plays left wing for the Arizona Coyotes. Uh, Two years ago, Taylor Hall won the 2018 NHL MVP. He had 39 goals and 34 assists in that season. He played for the New Jersey Devils at the time. And last year in the 2018-2019 season, he hurt his knee. He only played in 33 games. He got knee surgery. And then this year after, you know, coming back from knee surgery, he got a slow start with the Devils. Uh, you know, the coach was fired in 30 games. Taylor Hall only scored six goals, which is really not on par for him. And so he got traded to Arizona. In 30 games with the, with the New Jersey Devils, he scored six goals. Through 16 games with the Arizona Coyotes, he scored seven goals. So he has more goals in about half as many games as he played with his former team. That's pretty cool to me. And I want to pause this for a minute and talk about the trade because I really, good for Arizona for taking a risk and trading for Taylor Hall. Taylor Hall, you know, currently the Arizona Coyotes are in the wild card and they took a risk to trade for Taylor Hall to improve their roster. They traded three prospects and two draft picks to go get him. And it's really cool to see the Arizona Coyotes going for it. They're going to, you know, they didn't trade any, any of their starters away. They just made their starting lineup better by trading for Taylor Hall. And uh, they took a risk, man. They traded for Taylor Hall, a guy who's really talented, but has been hurt in the past. He wasn't playing his best when they traded for him. But I think it's so cool. The Coyotes are hungry to make it into the playoffs. And Taylor Hall has absolutely had a positive impact on their roster and on their team. The risk is paying off. I love it. I'm happy for Taylor Hall. He's kind of getting his career back and rejuvenating what the career he had. He's going to make the playoffs. He's on a better team now, making an impact, and good for the Coyotes, again, for taking a risk, for trading away their parts of their future for the here and now to try to make the playoffs and make a run this year. Round of applause to the uh, Arizona Coyotes. I love it. I love the aggression. And I'm rooting for Taylor Hall, who's having kind of a comeback season this year, even after being a you know, rough start. But with the Coyotes, he's a new player who's rejuvenated and playing better. And I'm, just, I'm really finding myself rooting for Taylor Hall. Hope he has a great year. Hope they make the playoffs. I, I just, man, the Arizona Coyotes, to me, that's a cool story. Took a risk. They went for it. It seems like it's paying off. That's awesome. Now, the last NHL story I want to talk about is that supposedly <laughs> the Philadelphia Flyers mascot, Gritty, punched a 13-year-old boy, which is like... I. I had to talk about it because, like, it's the biggest story right now in the NHL, which is, like, kind of sad because, like, the NHL clearly, like, if this is their big story, it's because they're on break, I guess. But uh, there's no video footage of the, the the punching incident. There's no way of knowing really what happened. It's more of a he said, she said thing. It's just a super weird story, and I think everyone's going to want my opinion because, like, you talk about the NHL, there's going to be comments saying, you know, talk about Gritty punching a 13-year-old. Here's my comment. We have no way of knowing. There's no... We just got to wait and see what happens. because, And it could take years, by the way, for this to go to trial and figure it all out. So I have no idea. Maybe they just settle. I don't know. Uh, I don't know why you would make up the story that Grady punched you unless you want money, I guess. But I, I have no idea, right? We, we don't know what happened. I don't even want, I shouldn't even, even say that because now it's going to look like I don't believe the kid. So I, I don't know what happened to the Philadelphia Flyers mascot. It's a very weird story. Um, and really just time will tell. There's nothing beyond that. It's just a, it's a weird thing. It's not really even about sports. It's just about a mascot doing potentially dumb stuff. So I don't know what happened to the mascot, and uh, I'm going to move on from that because I just there's no way of knowing what, in fact, happened. Okay, guys, that, that's what I did. I did an NHL segment. You're welcome. I, you're welcome. Like, that's, people have been asking for that for a while, but it's not like I hate hockey. I really like hockey. 
Um, and I, I don't know how to follow hockey. I don't know how to cover hockey. This is the first thing for me in every aspect. I'm learning how to cover the sport of hockey. Uh, it's a new one for me. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm doing the best I can. And if there are things you want me to talk about in the world of hockey, please let me know because I have a heart for it. I'm interested in it. I just need you guys to help point me in the right directions because I don't actually know how to... Like I, I know the big stories in the NFL. I know the big stories in the NBA. A new sport I've never followed before is harder to, for me to go... Oh, that's like I even looked up. I was like, "Who are the the Emma, the the MVP favorites right now in the NHL?" And I couldn't even find it. I was like, "There's no articles. There's not a lot going on. It's not a lot covering the NHL right now and talking about the same narrative as I would talk about if it was football or basketball." So, I don't know. And uh, if if you can help me, tell me what you want me to cover relating to the NHL. All right, guys. Um, Joe Brady, the new offensive coordinator of the Carolina Panthers did his first ever interview as a member of the Carolina Panthers. It was very vague. He didn't give very much information. He kept saying over and over again, like, and he made a good point. He said, I don't want to do a disservice by making claims that I'm not prepared to make. I haven't watched a lot of film. And he even joked about not being able to find his office yet. Like, he's, he's clearly very new to the Carolina Panthers. But I don't think he meant to. And this is not a bad thing, by the way. I, when I say that, it makes it sound like Joe Brady did something bad. Um, but he gave an important answer that I think reveals why OTAs are so important. So OTAs, what that stands for is organized team activities. There are mandatory OT or there are voluntary OTAs, which means that players don't have to show up to them. And so first I want to be clear that um, all the best coaches in, and really any sport, I believe, but especially football are really good at evaluating their players, figuring out what their players skill set and what their strengths are and then designing an offense or designing a defense or designing a scheme that takes advantage of the skill set of their players. So you, as a coach, it's your job to tailor your system to your players to make the most and get the most out of your players. That's what I believe good coaches do. You're like, uh, is, is this guy fast? Does he have good hands? Is he good at jumping? Is he good at three-pointers? Like, what is he good at? And how can we adjust our system to fit the needs of the player. And you can do this by, you know, one of the ways you can evaluate your players is by watching tape. But I, I want it to be very clear that while watching tape is a great way to evaluate a player and a great way to evaluate their strengths and evaluate what they're good at, an even better way to do that is to pick, play catch with them. An even better way to do that is to see them live in person because what you see on tape is one thing. But when you see a player in person, you might recognize traits and recognize qualities and skill sets you couldn't see on tape because you they didn't do them. Like uh, a great example is uh, maybe on tape you never see a guy make a I, I don't know cover great in zone. Like he's never covered uh, in zone coverage because the team ran man the entire time. But then you get him on the field and you're like, oh, this guy's really great at zone coverage. This isn't in his tape anywhere. My point is there are some traits and qualities about a player you can't see on tape, and even if you can't see them on tape, it's actually better played out in person. So every year there are reports of a player, there, there will be this year again, skipping OTAs. This player is skipping organized team activities or he's skipping mandatory meetings or this or that. But the reason why it's a big deal that a player skips OTAs or skips those organized team activities is because he's not working with the coaching staff and the coaching staff isn't getting to get to know you, the player, in person. They're not getting to witness your skill set live and in person, which means that it makes it more difficult for them to build a scheme around the player's skill set and the player's strengths if they haven't ever worked with you or haven't worked with you in a long time in person, face-to-face. -face. Again, you can see skill on film, but there's even more depth in person when you see someone and work with them face-to-face -face and in person. This is why organized team activities matter in the NFL. At some point, in months from now, you're going to read stories that this guy's skipping OTAs or that guy's skipping OTAs or this or that. The reason why it's important for players to go to OTAs and the reason why it's important and newsworthy that down the road players are going to skip OTAs is because it makes it harder for coaches to get to know a player's skill set and build an offense around it. When you get to know someone in person, you get to see them live, it's easier for you to build a playbook and build a system or on the strength of the player you're talking about. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so 
very much for tuning in. Uh, I want to remind everybody, if you're struggling, please go get help. Uh, four years ago, February 8, 2016, my younger brother died. He took his life. <sighs> and it's uh, heartbreaking, man. Uh, it's the worst thing I've ever been through. Uh, the suicide hotline is 1-800-273-8255. The suicide hotline is 1-800-273-8255. 1-800-273-8255. Uh, look, call it if you need to, but I, I hope you don't have to. I hope that you can talk to people in your life. Uh, the, the suicide hotline is important because they, they literally, if you talk about it, it's required you mention the suicide hotline if you're going to be in the media. Uh, but I, 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 think, I, I really think you should talk to people in your life uh, a person in authority, maybe a friend, a family member, go get a counselor if you need to. But my, my point is this, if you're struggling, don't suffer in silence, go get help of some kind. Uh, my younger brother took his life and he never told anybody he was having a hard time. I saw my brother every single week, every single day. We worked together. We worked at a car wash together at the time. I guess I was technically his boss. And, uh, my, I saw, we played Halo together once a week. Like we saw each other a lot. And he never once told me he was having a hard time. So that's partially on him. It's also partially on me. As a brother, I didn't do a good enough job asking him, hey man, are you okay? I, I did see him once a week. I did see him all the time. And we had very surface level conversations about sports, about movies, about video games, about girls. And we never went to that next level of depth where it's like, hey man, are you okay? How are you doing? He went through a breakup recently when he died. And I, I'd never really asked him in depth how he was doing with the breakup. Like he could have been having a horrible time and no one knew. And so, you know, I just want to, Tell everybody, if you're struggling, go get help. And then make sure the people in your life know how much you love them, how much you care about them. Tell the people that, hey, you can come talk to me if you need to. Just don't be afraid to have conversations with more depth. And uh, I'm just begging you, man. If you're out there and you're having a hard time, you're, you're in a dark place, I I'm begging you, please. You matter. We want you here. Um, you know, <laughs> it's a, a bad joke, but you listen to Strong and Band Sports really just help me. So I I'd want you around. If not, for that reason, at the very least. But please, man, I'm telling you. Uh, we want you on planet Earth, and so if you're struggling, please go get help. Uh, it, it's really important. My brother never did go get help. My brother's gone, and uh, I can't help my brother, but I can help you if you're out there. Uh, if you're struggling, please go get help and make sure the people in your life know how much you care about them and how much you love them. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so very much for tuning in. I hope you have a great day, and uh, -um -bum, bam, we are done.